Thank you, everyone. As uh, John mentioned, I'm Chuck Taylor. I'm in Dr. Jim Beasley's lab out at Savannah River Ecology Lab <clears throat> under uh, the University of Georgia in Warnell. And before I get started, I just want to thank John and the uh, Center for the Ecology and Infectious Diseases for having me out here to give this presentation. Um, so I'm going to be giving a brief and, and broad overview of the history, kind of a management framework, and some current and recent research that's been done in our lab on invasive wild pigs in the United States. That. So to get started, um, Suscrofa, what are we talking about in general here? Um, the, the speciation of Suscrofa. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe. Three dots. You have a three dots. There you go. And hide. Yeah. There we go. Thank you very much. Oh, no, yeah, no problem. Um, so, speciation began two to four million years ago. And since then, there's been a lot of divergence into different breeds and things like that. I kind of likened it to the domestic dog. You can think about that, different breeds and things like that, but it's all under what we consider Suscrofa, the wild pig, Eurasian wild boar, domestic swine, um, all, all the same species there. And so this is a globally distributed species. You see in the dark black there is, is kind of their native range everywhere from Northern Africa across all of Eurasia. And you, if, if you're familiar somewhat with geography, you can see already that the species adapted to a wide range of environments. And this is gonna come into play later on, but uh, today through many different reasons, mainly anthropogenic movements, they're found in six out of the seven continents in the world, everywhere except for Antarctica. So specifically here in the United States, what this looks like is uh, colonial expeditions starting with uh, Christopher Columbus and subsequent expeditions brought uh, fair, uh, domestic swine and sort of treated them as free range livestock. These were no enclosures, but uh, somewhat kept and they would just kind of take them uh, you know, as needed, uh, but they were kind of free ranging and they were, they were pretty much treated as private property. You see here, ear notching is a common technique uh, to distinguish ownership, but there was no control, no regulation. These feral swine <clears throat> were just kind of in little pockets across the region, um, across the United States. And slowly over time, as more pigs were brought over and more lands were colonized and things like that, you started to get these little pockets of feral pigs uh, across the landscape. And by the early 1900s, uh, they were fairly widespread throughout America. And uh, this will be ramped up in, in recent decades. We'll talk about here in a second through anthropogenic movements, as I mentioned. But uh, you can see here over the centuries, the, the kind of gradual decline or incline of, of where pigs are found in the United States. Another kind of uh, uh, interesting um, occurrence in all of this was the introduction of Eurasian wild boar starting in the late 1800s, but really in the early 1900s is where this took place. Uh, you see several different places in the Northeast and also Texas. These were brought over into fenced game preserves. Um, the reason for these introductions were a novel game species, uh, a trophy, if you will, for hunters um, to, to hunt year round. It was, uh, you know, they were popular you know, used for meat. Uh, it was it was a new thing to be able to hunt in these in these locations. And then after these initial uh, introductions, you see uh, many different subsequent introductions throughout the Southeast and California. And the kind of result of this introduction, you know, again, they were introduced into these fenced game preserves, but over time, there was both accidental and purposeful <coughs> releases. Uh, these, these things weren't always well kept. Uh, and what we have today, as we think of Suscrofa here in the United States, is a combination of these pockets of feral swine that developed over centuries and slowly started regionally expanding. Uh, mixed with this Eurasian wild boar that was brought over purposefully as a novel game species to hunt. And so we have uh, the, the wild pigs that we think of here today in America are vastly uh, or mostly these hybrids uh, between the two. So we see a population expansion that really kind of ramped up in the 1980s and 1990s. And the reason for this, I've kind of hinted at, hinted at it, is the anthropogenic movement of wild pigs. And as I mentioned before, Eurasian wild boar were brought in as a novel game species to hunt. 
And what this kind of did was <clears throat> people with uh, in areas with no pigs wanted there to be pigs. They're, they're you know they were a popular species to hunt. And as as time went on, you can see in the graph on the left here, especially around the 80s and 90s, we saw the the result of this. Um, pigs have a very small home range, right? Um, you know, uh, realistically, that you're talking about six to eight square kilometers. They don't spread that quickly naturally. You wouldn't see spread like this as a natural, um, uh, just a natural spread of, of wild pigs. This is the result of uh, anthropogenic movement. And the graph in the middle, I think, really shows this. You see these pockets in the Northeast and North Dakota and, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. These obviously are not pigs that are spreading from Texas and Georgia and things like that. They're, they're being brought over here, uh, usually in a pickup truck or something like that. Um, and and our, uh, our, our friends to the north, Canada is not immune to this as well. They, they saw their own population spike in the 2000s, mainly across the three prairie provinces. You see here Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba. And so the reason for all this, or, or the result of all this is commonly referred to as a pig bomb that has gone off in recent decades. <laughs> and you say, well, you have this you know, rapidly uh, increasing number of, of feral and domestic and Eurasian wild boar, all, all these swine are increasing. We know that, but what's the problem with that? Well, hearkening back to my first slide, I refer to them as invasive. And if you're familiar with the term invasive, it's, it's a non-native species that has a negative impact on its environment and pigs have no, short, no shortage of negative impacts on their environment. Here in the United States, it's really focused around one of the, one of the major impacts they have is economics. You're talking about a one and a half billion dollars in damage uh, annually in the United States, the vast majority of that being agricultural in nature. But they also destroy native habitat, native forests, native grasses uh, through their rooting and wallowing behavior. They cause erosion, uh, pre, um, yeah, erosion to waterways, and uh, there, the pig vehicle collisions have been increasing in recent decades as populations expand. Uh, wild pigs are omnivorous; they they predate on both animal and plant matter. And diet species that have been done on wild pigs have shown. Some of the main groups that are being predated upon are reptiles and amphibians, which you can think of globally as some of the most sensitive species we have across the world. So this can be a, a major impact felt by wild pigs. And also they outcompete native species for food and, and different resources as well. Uh, specific to this symposium, uh, the disease factor, the, the ability of wild pigs to be a, a carrier of you know, over 45 disease and parasites. The main ones we think about here in the United States tend to be brucellosis, classical and African swine fever, uh, pseudo rabies, but also uh, I, th I think it's important to mention JEV obviously as a potential um, one in the future for the United States. I know I was reading earlier that they've already found it in feral populations in Australia, I think. So easy to imagine, hopefully not, but easy to imagine uh, a spread there. So you've got this rapidly expanding population, all these negative impacts across the, across the country, obviously there's need for management. And this started in the 1990s with the increase in populations, but it really took foothold in the 2010s, specifically 2014 with the formation of the National Feral Swine Damage Management Program, which is really organized and, and headed by the United States Department of Agriculture and also the National Wild Pig, uh, Wild Pig Task Force. Um, both of these are really focused around the research around wild pigs, um, finding out more about their ecology and things of that nature, but also uh, kind of zoning in on and improving on management techniques. Um, also the boots on the ground, actual management of the species, as well as communication in, uh, in, in areas with up and coming populations and, and little knowledge about them. So what does this look like? boots on the ground, actual implementation of management. There's two main schools of thought, starting with lethal, the lethal side of things. All of these are used in some combination of recreationally and professionally, depending on different state laws. Um, but shooting and hunting, this is typically done with thermal scopes, while pigs are more active at nighttime, uh, during the nighttime. Aerial gunning with helicopters, 
If you're not familiar with the Judas technique, uh, this involves trapping or catching a group of pigs, euthanizing all but one, fitting it with a radio collar and letting it loose. Pigs are gregarious species. They enjoy being in groups. That collared pig is going to find any group of pigs in the area. And then the process repeats. You catch that group, eliminate all but that one, let it go. You might be more familiar. They've done this also with uh, feral goats in Hawaii as well. Uh, and then toxicants have been uh, in recent decades um, researched and trialed often, but to, the, uh, to date, none are currently registered for use in the United States. The flip side of that coin is, is non-lethal management. These, you can imagine, are more temporary in nature. Their effectiveness is, is variable, but uh, nonetheless, they can be effective. One of the more commonly used methods is exclusion fencing. Um, but you can imagine very expensive and you're limited in the scope in which you can use this. You're not going to fence an entire national forest. It's just typically not feasible. There's also things like supplemental feeding and repellents that have varying levels of success and are uh, typically temporary. And then also along the same vein as toxicants, we have contraceptives. None are currently registered for use in the United States, but they are, uh, they are out there. And so we've had these national level management tech, uh, these national level management organizations in place for close to a decade now. Why are there still pigs on the landscape? <laughs> well, there's several challenges that come with uh, wild pigs. And the first and foremost is one that I've kind of already talked about. They were adapted to live in many different environments. And we see that here in the United States. They're ecological generalists. They've, they've, uh, they inhabit much of the United States already, but you can see in this heat map, the kind of brighter orange reddish areas are uh, higher in relative occupancy probability, whereas the cooler areas uh, are, are, are less uh, likely to be occupied. But you can see not a whole lot of blue on this map. They, they already live in Canada to Mexico, Florida to California. Um, the, there's very few places where they can't call home. And in that same vein, they have few effective predators along or, or within their home range in America. There's areas where they encounter things like black bears and cougars that may have somewhat of an impact, but generally across the range, you're talking about bobcats and coyotes. These meso predators are not having a major impact on these populations. They may sneak a, a juvenile or young of the year here and there, but they're not having a real effect. Humans by and large are the main uh, a predation factor of wild pigs in the United States. They're also extremely fecund. Uh, we may know this from the domestic side of things, but uh, these things can reproduce very quickly. They, there is no breeding season in the United States. They've been known to reproduce and be pregnant in every month out of the year. They have up to three litters in as little as 14 months. Litter sizes can range from six to eight on average, but can be as many as 10. Uh, they have very low neo, neonatal uh, predation rates as well. And they can reproduce as little as six months of age with a four month gestation period. So this is a, a breeding machine, if you will. <laughs> and another challenge that isn't uh, talked about as often is this poor understanding of basic ecology. You can see here the number of publications on pigs really didn't start ramping up until that population boom that we saw in the, in the 90s and 2000s. So a newly studied species that is very misunderstood and, and, and not very well understood at all and not very well researched historically. So where are we at today in the United States with management of wild pigs? Well, at, at one point they've been reported as, as many as 48 states, about 35 have somewhat of a population today uh, with an estimated population of around seven to eight million animals. Uh, there have been recent eradication success stories, some possible eradication successes, um, but the truth is around the southeast, wild pigs are widespread and, and doing very well, as well as California. Um, so progress has been made, but there's still uh, quite a bit of effort that is needed. And this kind of goes back to uh, the figure I showed earlier. Research is needed for this, not only to uh, improve on current management techniques, such as you know, the toxicants and contraceptives that we talked about. They've only been around for the past half a decade, decade or so, um, but also developing new management techniques. Um, a couple decades ago, we never, you know, we weren't thinking about things like toxicants and contraceptives. So that's always um, constantly being improved upon. 
So this last section of the talk, I wanna talk specifically about a few papers and projects that have been done in the Beasley lab specifically. Only a couple of these have I actually been hands-on. So this is gonna be a brief overview, uh, forgive me for that. But starting with Lindsay Klontz's paper that came out last year in 2021, she was looking at wild pig movement and uh, behavior with the objective being to explore the correlation between wild pig behavioral states and resource selection across two distinct seasons, those being both high and low forage availability. This work was done on Savannah River site in South Carolina, and I'll go ahead and um, break this down because this is gonna be a common theme throughout the research. Savannah River site is a United States Department of Energy facility located in South Carolina where Savannah River Ecology Lab is located as well as Dr. Beasley and his lab. It's around 300 square kilometer property that's been used for the past few decades as a research facility. Before that, it was actually used uh, as a testing site for nuclear weapons. So um, we're lucky to have that as, a, as our own personal research facility or property. But in this study specifically, they trapped and collared wild pigs from 2014 to 2019. And uh, they, they were able to analyze those GPS points that they recovered. Um, with hidden Markov models. I'll talk about them in a second, but they included many different habitat covariates, such as distance to road and distance to hard mast and things like that uh, to fit a resource selection analysis. And if you're not familiar with hidden Markov models, I included this picture in the bottom right. Basically, you're using uh, these GPS coordinates and it takes the <coughs> turn angles and step, step distances that you gather from those and kind of filters them into these different behavioral states. And Depending on the project, you can fit as many behavioral states as you want, but Lindsay in this paper uh, used the three resting, foraging, and traveling as you see there. So just some broad level takeaways. Uh, we were able to see you know, on, on a very fine scale, these uh, differences in resource selection, not only between sexes of animals, but also between different forage availabilities. So in the bottom right, you can see that resource selection function. I know it's hard to read, it's small, but uh, these are basically all of the habitat covariates uh, uh, through males and females. This is both low forage availability um, and kind of see what pigs are selecting for at different times of the year between sexes. And then the figure in the bottom left is showing uh, between males and females, between low and high forage uh, availability, what pigs are doing, what behavioral states they're exhibiting throughout the daytime. So that lighter portion in the middle there is, is daytime hours and the darker portions on either side are nighttime. Uh, again, I know this is hard to read. You're gonna have to uh, pull up the, the, the paper specifically if you want uh, specifics. But overall, this provided management extremely useful information on what pigs are doing at different times of the year and between sexes. So they know what areas and, and, and regions to focus on to target certain pigs. Next, we'll look at Chelsea Titus's paper, which came out this year uh, on wild pig social structure and mating strategies. The objective here is to describe the re relatedness and demographic composition of wild pig social groups, or sounders as they're called, and to investigate the effect of ancestry and age on male reproductive contribution. This work was done again on SRS, and also the Noble Research Institute uh, has a few ranches in Texas, Oklahoma, Texas and Oklahoma, which was utilized for this. And they uh, used hair and tissue samples that were collected anywhere from 2010 to 2019. This DNA was extracted and genotyped for analysis. So this, this paper has a lot of figures. And I, I just wanted to show a few here just to give you something to look at. But um, essentially, they found that previously held assumptions on these social structures were generally correct, but oversimplified. We think of the main groups of wild pigs being females and their young and, and groups of females and their young and then solitary males. But through this study, they found that these bachelor groups, groups of, of just males and solitary females were not only apparent, they were prevalent across all three regions that they looked at. They found that unrelated members were common within these sounders. They typically didn't dictate or, or they weren't uh, the majority of these sounders, but they certainly were there. And also that unrelated members were rare within these bachelor groups that they found, which was interesting. Also, they found that, uh, again, the male mating strategy portion of the paper, they found that age was positively correlated with litter size. This is in the, in the view of males. So uh, older uh, male boar pigs sired larger litters on average is what they found. 
And also the ancestry portion of that was they looked at the percentage of European uh, wild boar lineage and found that that was negatively correlated with litter size. So the more uh, of this European ancestry in a wild boar pig led to smaller litters on average. Next uh, is Sarah Chin's paper that came out this year looking at factors influencing reproductive characteristics in wild pigs. The objective here is to quantify reproductive parameters in wild pigs relative to a suite of individual and environmental attributes. This work again was done on SRS 2017 to 2020. And they collected a host of different uh, data from females and uh, fetuses that were culled on site. Savannah River site is, uh, is consistently managed for wild pigs. Typically this is done by the US Forest Service, but also private contractors uh, manage pigs on site as well. And they took advantage of, of these uh, carcasses that they had for this study. The attributes they looked at, mass, age class, they also looked at the relative genetic association to European boar, but this was on the female side of things, whereas Chelsea's paper was for uh, the males, this being the female side of things. And uh, also mast availability was, was the environmental attribute they looked at. So some takeaways, uh, this is similar to the graph I showed earlier, but they found that females produced offspring in every month out of the year. Uh, we confirmed there, there is no breeding season here. You see peaks and valleys and that typically corresponds with forage availability, but they are reproducing in every month out of the year. Uh, they found the likelihood of pregnancy was influenced by female, female mass, so heavier females were more likely to be present, pregnant, as well as that uh, older and larger females correlated with uh, larger litter size. And in this study, they found that ancestry to European boar had no real important, wasn't an important factor in litter size. So whereas the males were negatively correlated with litter size on the female side of things, uh, there wasn't a hard conclusion there. Finally, this is a paper that uh, I was able to be a co-author on it's in print currently, but uh, Joe Treichler did this work looking at population and damage in response to management of wild pigs. Objective here to quantify changes in wild pig populations and subsequent, subsequent changes in damages, different kinds of damages caused by wild pigs in response to management. This was done on 19 private properties across three different counties in South Carolina from 2019 to 2022. And this is uh, a little busy of a study. It's, it's hard to explain in a, you know, a couple minute span, but essentially properties were signed up to work with USDA Wildlife Services to conduct management on those properties. Prior to management, after sign up, we went in, conducted several different surveys to get a pre-treatment, we'll call it treatment, pre-treatment level of these damages. Whereas after those first surveys were conducted, management was allowed to happen for the rest of the duration of the study outside of the two-week camera surveys that we did twice a year. So the environmental, to, to calculate the environmental damage, they were done by surveys that involved 10 transects per property that uh, covered about 1% of habitat. So these transects were different lengths depending on size of the property. And these were conducted once a year. Agriculture damage was done by phone surveys conducted with landowners once a year. And to get a, a relative abundance index of population, we conducted two week dated camera surveys that were done twice a year, both in the winter and the summer. And again, removals were ongoing after these first surveys were done. Th this is an example of a property on the left here, the, uh, the red lines being the transects that we walked and those green dots being cameras, but just so you could see an example, um, some agriculture damage there. And this uh, is an example of one of the traps that wildlife services would implement on these properties. So some takeaways here, uh, we found some good news. Management works. <laughs> uh, environmental damage decreased significantly about 99% over the first two years of the study. We found crop damage that decreased but not significantly about 40%. This being the least reliable of the three things that we looked at. Uh, landowner phone surveys that were done you know, after the crop year. So a lot of uh, variability in responses there. And then the relative abundance index we came up with, we used average detections per camera day to get a relative, relative abundance index. And this decreased about 70%. Uh, 
uh, over the first 18 months after the study, which is positive. And also we looked at removals over time by wildlife services and these also decreased. So you can imagine if you keep effort constant, you would wanna see those removals decrease. It means you're making some kind of impact on the population. So again, positive news. Finally, I just wanna briefly go over some ongoing projects. Um, we're currently uh, doing a elimination project on Blackbeard Island, which is an island off the coast of Georgia. It's also a national wildlife refuge that has had a population of pigs for some time, I think close to a, the past century. It's been several decades. And a major concern there is it's a major breeding ground for sea turtles. So they're very concerned about wild pigs rooting on the beaches and having negative impacts on sea turtles there. So we hired a researcher and technician um, trapper to try to eliminate pigs on the island. And we're currently um, incorporating data found there in several other projects as well. And then the two chapters of my thesis are, as John mentioned, evaluating different models of estimating abundance. So I'm kind of using Joe's data, the Joe, Joe Treichler in the last project, the camera, environmental and, and crop data. I'm kind of continuing on his data and using that for my own work. So I'm utilizing the camera surveys that I talked about uh, and going a step further and using mark recite models um, trying to individually ID these pigs due to natural peelage or scarring, things like that, getting an abundance, uh, an estimate of abundance through those, as well as using removal models, uh, incorporating the removal data from wildlife services uh, and kind of comparing those two abundance estimators. Uh, I'm also going to be investigating the effectiveness of co uh, different common trap types used for wild pigs. And this will incorporate data from wildlife services across four different states as of right now. Uh, in the United States. And then finally, we have a uh, student that's currently exploring diet and, and how that changes with seasonality. This figure actually comes from uh, one of her paper or uh, her first chapter in which she's found some really cool stuff already. You can see Eastern red bat. She found uh, a couple different instances of Eastern red bat, wild turkey, um, some interesting species there. So with that, I just want to thank the Beasley Wild Pig Lab in general, uh, especially the four researchers that I mentioned and their projects, Sarah Chin, Joe Treichler, Chelsea Titus, and Lindsay Klontz, all of the technicians that went into the work, um, obviously the University of Georgia, Savannah River Ecology Lab, Warnell, uh, the Department of Energy, allowing us onto Savannah River site, conduct research there, as well as USDA Wildlife Services for conducting removal events. I've included a little lit cited here in case anybody is in, uh, interested in the papers that I mentioned, uh, reach out and we can get access to those. And then finally, I can take any questions. Jim, I'm filling in for Jim on this talk. Um, he would be a great resource. He's really good at email communication. So if you have any questions, uh, prospective research, anything at all, feel free to, to reach out to him. He wanted me to include his contact info and mine as well. I can answer, try to answer any questions now, but uh, Again, if it's anything about those four projects, other than the ones I worked on, I may not know specifics, but thank you all very much for uh, having me. Do you have any questions? I have one. Um, Paul Sundberg, Swine Health Information Center. One of the things is we've talked to wildlife services about African swine fever response and the uh, opportunity to control feral pigs that might be infected. What, what I've heard from wildlife services is that the sounders are relatively uh, stable and limited in, in scope, limited in region, limited in their area. Um, but you said that they, there was unrelated pigs commonly found in sounders. Mm -hmm. So that would imply that something's happening there. Either there are individual pigs that are straying off and finding another sounder, or there's overlap between them. Do you have any sense of which of those is happening? I, I can't give specifics on that, but I would imagine, you know, from what I know about wild pigs, and I worked for wildlife services for three and a half years in a couple different states, how we generally think of pigs and, and that paper kind of, uh, you know, again, they found different things like bachelor groups and solitary females being prevalent. But generally, you think of sounders being uh, closely related females and they're young, and then yeah. uh, those individual roaming males. And so 
it could have something to do with those males, you know, sows going to heat and those boars uh, interact with those sounders. It could be something along those lines, but yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I know that, um, uh, again, the paper found that they were prevalent. They weren't necessarily making up the bulk of these sounders, but there were unrelated individuals in these sounders. So it would imply a higher level of difficulty in being able to control and respond to absolutely. a disease in, in any of those pigs. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's a good point because you do have crossover. You don't have the same sounder. Yeah. Uh, you have interactions there. Yes, yeah, so that's very, very true. Chuck Chung, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, Anna, uh, CEIB, I find it very disturbing that the reproductive success is increasing with age for both males and females, and that seems like backwards to me. Uh, I guess, is it just that they're not reaching their lifetime optimum because they're getting hunted and killed? Absolutely. These are some of the most persecuted animals that you'll find across the landscape. Um, Recreational hunting, national level management, very few, um, very few of these pigs on the landscape are making it to a natural, a natural death. Um, I think they estimate the numbers that I've heard is around five to six years old of a lifespan or, or maybe six or seven slightly older than a deer. But, uh, you know, we're going after these things with dogs, helicopters, everything but nuclear warfare, I think. So, um, yeah, that, that would probably play into that. That, that they're reaching sexual maturity, but they're not reaching that you know, the other side of the mountain, if you can imagine that. Chuck John King, CEID. One of the questions I have for you related to uh, the research sites that were in green. How close are those to the Savannah River? The research sites for the Joe's paper, this yeah. one right here? Yeah. The, the three different counties were uh, Newberry, Jasper, and Hampton. Jasper and Hampton were uh, located in South, I guess it'd be Southwestern South Carolina, closer to the coast. Jasper actually goes all the way down to the coast. And then Newberry is North uh, Western South Carolina, kind of a, about an hour Southeast of Clemson. Um, and SRS is kind of right in the middle of those. So sure. it's close, but not immediately. When I was in school studying zoology, I did a research project there. So I know how remote uh, Savannah River site is. Mm -hmm. Is there any current activities on a sentinel type of research to determine what infectious diseases may be spreading in these wild boars? That's a perfect habitat. On, on site? Yeah, that's all right. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think anyone currently in the Beasley lab is looking at that or anyone that I know of. I know there are some projects ongoing on site. Um, involving wild pigs, but I don't think anything is done on the on the disease side of things. But I, Dr. Beasley wanted me to mention that we've been collecting um, these tissue, hair, blood samples on these wild pigs for close to a decade now. We have hundreds and thousands of, of samples in a database that, that are ready to be uh, used as data for someone's research project. So we have a very large inventory of data there. Um, but not that I know of currently as far as disease. Beasley does a lot of toxicology work. He works a lot in Chernobyl and Fukushima um, at the, at the um, nuclear disaster sites over there. Uh, he has done quite a bit of disease work in the past, but I don't know of anything currently ongoing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Hi, I'm Megan Niederwerder from the Swine Health Information Center. I'm just curious, leading from what you just said, what are the typical biological samples that you're collecting for these hogs when you um, travel? So, um, and I'm trying to think of the data sheet. So, blood, uh, ear tissue, uh, different measurements, um, you know, uh, uh, ticks and lice, um, uh, general information about the you know sex and uh, color patterns and um, any, uh, if we catch them in a trap, any trap injuries, any non-trap injuries, uh, it's a whole collection of data. And, we, and like I said, we have thousands, maybe tens of thousands of these samples because every pig that we encounter on site through all of these projects mentioned, as well as uh, quite a bit that are um, managed for, for by the Forest Service and private contractors, you know, we collect for. So is it serum or whole blood? Uh, we have both. We do spin some down and we keep some whole blood as well. Yeah. 
And some of it is shipped off to, to agencies to analyze for these different studies, but we have, you know, we, we always keep some in our Thank you. inventory as well. Anything else? Any other questions at all? Any, Eric, any online questions? No, not at all. Okay. Thank you very much.